Danny Needs a Car. My friend Danny graduated high school in 71. He's probably the only kid who did not at least have a driver's license. He went off to Rensselaer Polytechnic in Troy, New York, just across the river from Albany. During the summers, he'd call friends for a ride, and we'd would hang out or go to clubs for live music. It was probably about 73, when my phone rang one evening, and my neighbor, Nutty Norman, called. His wife had been driving their Ford Country Squire station wagon through a neighboring town a few weeks earlier when someone ran a stop sign and crushed in the driver's side fender and door. She was uninjured, but the car was towed to a local service station. Well, on this fateful night, Norman calls and asks me if I wanted to buy the 67 Ford Country Squire wagon for $200. This is what he owed for towing and storage, and the garage wanted payment now. He apparently didn't have the money for this. So maybe... Now maybe I should give you some background on Nutty Norman. He's really not nutty, but the neighbors thought him strange, as he slept till noon, had breakfast, and would put her around till about 8 p.m. when he'd go into his lab and half of the two-car garage behind his house and work all night. He was an electrical engineer who had designed radio equipment during World War II and later set off on his own consulting business. I was friends with his son and actually discovered what he did when I was having trouble was getting my Cub Scout crystal radio kit working. I was probably eight at the time, and my parents suggested I go ask Norman since they knew he was an electrical engineer. So one evening after dinner, I took my 8 by 8 inch cardboard crystal radio kit with a coil wound on a toilet paper tube, fan and stock clips, a Galena crystal and cat whisker with headphones over to his house. I knocked on the front door and asked if I could talk to Mr. Anderson. I was eight years old, and it was a couple of years before we were on a first-name basis. His wife told me he was in his lab, and I should go down the driveway and up the steps and knock. Now, mind you, I'd only seen Mr. Anderson a couple of times before when I was playing with his son. So nervously, I walked up the steps and tapped on the door. Moments passed, and I heard him say, Who is it? I answered, and he said, Come in. This was the first time I had ever been inside the lab. I knew it was there, but the kids were not allowed. So I walk in, and Norman is at the far end, sitting at a desk, smoking a Pall Mall unfiltered cigarette, and drawing odd symbols on a pad of paper. He looks up at me, and the thing I had in my hand, and said, what do you want? I gulped and told him I was having a problem with my crystal radio kit for Cub Scouts. He had me set it on the bench, and ran, a le ran the length of the garage, and motioned for me to pull up one of the wheeled chairs that was by the bench. He looked at the device, and asked what what was the matter? My eyes darted about the room. There were all sorts of things I could only imagine were part of a mad scientist lab. There was an oscilloscope glowing green with a trace moving across the screen, things on the shelf with meters and dials, wires strung from one to the other, and the smell. Yes, the unmistakably musty smell of electronics. It's hard to describe, but there's a certain odor of warm transformers, hot vacuum tubes, and insulation that permeated the air. I was in a magical place. I don't know if I knew it then or it was to come to me later, but this is the beginning of my lifelong electronics career. Mr. Anderson examined the radio and pulled out a pad and pencil and sketched the circuit with odd symbols while muttering to himself. He stood up and went to the front of the room where there were several cabinets with divided drawers and came back with some parts which he placed on the bench. Next he strung a wire from what I later learned was his antenna and connected it and connected another wire to the ground strip that ran the length of the workbench. He attached the oscilloscope to where the headphones would go and turned some dials and moved the slider on the coil back and forth. The oscilloscope trace wiggled. He said, This is your trouble, kid, tapping his finger on the Galena crystal in its holder and opening a package that contained a Raytheon 1N32 germanium diode. He told me to put that in place of the cat whisker and crystal, which I did by pressing down the ears of the stock clips and inserting the leads. Suddenly, the oscilloscope was dancing with a waveform, a faint sound coming from the headphones. Moving the copper slider over the coil brought in several local AM radio stations, and would have run home right then overjoyed, but he was not finished. He took a box off the shelf that had several dials and explained it was a capacitor substitution box. There was one ceramic capacitor in the circuit that we removed and put the alligator clips from the box in place. He set the dials to match the part that had been removed and then started clicking the dials until the scope showed the strongest signal. 
he went back to the parts bins and got a capacitor of the same value and replaced that one that came with the kit. Thus began my lifetime fascination with electronics and technology. Oh yeah, this was about me selling Danny his first car. About 74 or 75, Danny was home for the summer. I had bought a Country Squire for $200. <clears throat> I had bought the Country Squire for $200 and got the fender and door from a junkyard. I had a friend who had a body shop, for, and for 100 bucks he painted them to match. So Danny was home for the summer. I had a car to sell, and myself and a couple of friends convinced him how wonderful it would be to have his own car and get his license. I really didn't make a dime off the sale, but now we had a willing victim under the auspices of learning to drive to chauffeur the rest of us around. Absolutely brilliant. Well, back to Nutty Norman. Well, it turns out he was a longtime friend of Les Paul. You know, the Les Paul of Gibson fame and musician? Norman had worked as a consultant with Ampex on the first 8-track recording machines, worked developing guitar pickups, and also the first moving coil phonograph pickup for Fairchild. Most of Norman's cars were two three-year-old late model Fords, which they later discovered were ex Les Paul cars. Seems he took them in trade for consulting work. So that summer we gave Danny driving lessons until he got his life license. That. So that summer we gave Danny driving lessons until he got his license. He drove us to every Dairy Queen in northern New Jersey. <laughs>